revolution. But it, I know it's taking over. Revolution. But it, that's why I'm telling everybody worldwide. This is my world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Revolution. Welcome everybody. This is Jim Lee from Climate Viewer News. It's January 17th, 2016, and today we're going to cover the graphic details of chemtrails, how they work, and what's all involved. So what you can see here is uh, we're at climateviewer.com slash chemtrails. You can just click on chemtrails at the top. And uh, I'm going to go through some of the scientific terms. There's going to be a lot of science involved here. This is for the people who are not just getting into chemtrails, but have been dealing with this for quite a while and want answers. So um, let's get down to it. Both chemtrails and contrails are high-level descriptors, meaning they're highly argumentative and have different meanings to different people. So what terms all are there? Uh, chemtrails, contrails, persistent contrails, spreading contrails, contrail cirrus, contrail-induced cloudiness, aviation-induced cloudiness, aviation-induced cirrus, induced cirrus cloudiness, jet-produced cloud cover, man-made clouds, artificial clouds, and global dimming. Um, so the entire chemtrail conspiracy boils down to one thing, intent. The problem with searching for intent is that it leaves people looking for a smoking gun or a whistleblower or a note from the guy who ordered planes to spray the world. Uh, this is actually a search for a straw man and is likely designed to waste your time. If you want to end the planes making clouds, all the evidence you need is in this article. And all that's needed is proper uh, protest at the proper places. Are rogue geoengineers intentionally spraying the material to create clouds that cover the sky, or is this just a dirty, unregulated industry doing what all fossil fuel industries do? Polluting. Based on the evidence, we can show that military has intentions to use carbon black dust to modify weather for warfare purposes, and commercial aviation produces tons of carbon black dust. Um, due to the overwhelming amount of propaganda surrounding the topic of chemtrails, I've uh, researched for more than three years to clear the air on chemtrails as part of what I have dubbed Operation Clarity. And this is my final report. Um, there are three sides to every story, your side, his side, and the truth. Conspiracy believers uh, claim that chemtrails are a secret program that do X, Y, and Z. Debunkers say chemtrails are contrails and completely normal, i.e. harmless. The truth is that artificial clouds are destructive to nature, harmful to health, and there is nothing normal about fire-breathing metal tubes spewing nanoparticles at 30,000 feet. Despite more than 60 years of jet aircraft, quote, accidentally geoengineering, scientists are now wanting to legalize global weather control, and we must stop this. So um, at the COP21 conference, they said they don't want the, heat, the planet to heat more than 1.5 degrees Celsius, um, and without uh, geoengineering, that'll never happen. Unfortunately, we must uh, really stop these guys. So what makes a chemtrail? The answer is soot, sulfur, metal particles, nanoparticles, and water. Carbon black dust and carbon black aerosol, is known, also known as soot, is coated um, in sulfur and uh, shoots out of the rear jet engines. Water sticks to these sulfur-coated soot particles and clouds form. Soot is a cloud condensation nuclei and sulfuric acid um, increases the likelihood of cloud formation. So, first reference particles in cloud, um, cirrus clouds, POSI-2. Uh, aircraft soot particles are good ice nuclei. Here we have from the U.S. Air Force. Um, fuel sulfur is responsible for rapid volatile PM formation in the plume. Sulfate aerosols create nucleation mode and coat soot particles. So, um, between that and these ISSRs, that's what makes a cloud. And um, all of this is claimed to be unknown aerosol um, cloud interaction are one of the main uncertainties in climate research. Um, carbon black dust and weather modification. So in the 1970s, on the possibility of weather modification by aircraft contrails, they quote, said, quote, likely that contrails are affecting precipitation to a much greater extent than our present deliberate seeding operations. Then in 1975, William Gray said, let's steer some hurricanes with carbon black dust. Here's a chart of that, and you can see the carbon black dust shooting out of the jet engine. And here they say carbon makes section in the jet engine. Then in 2008, Dr. Mosh Alamaro proposed steering hurricanes with carbon black dust using Department of Homeland Security money. And you can see that, that's the um, hurricane modification workshop at the Department of Homeland Security. Then we have two 1994 FOIA documents from the Sunshine Project that show the U.S. Air Force and Navy are involved in uh, using 
carbon black dust to do weather modification. The first from the Navy is at China Lake, California. That's where uh, they made the chemicals for weather warfare in Vietnam. And then here from the Phillips lab, from the Air Force Research Lab, um, weather modification using carbon black. Charts for that, you click the pictures, you can go to the links, read the originals. Um, then, right after 1994, the Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force said, come up with new technologies that will help us be dominant all the way to 2025. The most famous of those is weather modification as a, weather as a force multiplier, owning the weather in 2025. In the middle of that um, page, you can see right here is a chart um, of future technologies, and you'll see right here, STAR, CBD. STAR means technologies to be developed by the Department of Defense. In 2005, they want to use carbon black dust to modify the weather. One more reference for carbon black dust. The following year, this is not on any website I've read um, so far, uh, the owning the weather papers were made reality when the U.S. Air Force and U.S. Army had a conference called Text T Test Technology Symposium 97 Weather Modification. Dr. Arnold Barnes from the Phillips Lab, previously mentioned in the FOIA, um, talks about weather modification using carbon black and he lists it the reasons to do it as uh, those that are in the weather 2025 document and then he goes a little further increase cirrus cloud cover which is what we're seeing cirrus clouds um, created by planes deny visual satellite or high altitude reconnaissance um, decrease light level for nighttime operations so block satellites in space from spying on us and make it darker when we do night ops um, and then finally, the, the, near the end of the thing, it says current capabilities, 1997, create, suppress, cirrus contrails. So create contrails, suppress contrails, create cirrus clouds, and suppress them. So they could do that in 1997. Um, we can all see it overhead. Uh, P.S., the chemtrail conspiracy, the first time the world chemtrail was ever used on the Internet was 1997. Um, so clearly the U.S. military is involved in that. Are chemtrails a bad um, thing? Yes, they create a Venus effect by trapping heat. And, uh, you know, even in the IPCC report that on contrails, did you know that it was co-authored by five geoengineering solar radiation management advocates? That's interesting. Philip Rarsh, uh, Ken Caldera, Ben Kravitz, Alan Robach, and Trude Storielmo. Um, all five of those guys are geoengineering advocates, and they're helping write the IPCC reports. That's kind of shady if you ask me. Um, the lead author um, in that report said that there was a lot of uncertainties about contrails. Then four years later said this. Contrails formed by aircraft can evolve into cirrus clouds indistinguishable from those formed naturally. These spreading contrails may be causing more climate warming today than all of the carbon dioxide emitted by aircraft since the start of aviation. Yeah. Um, then the next page is by Haywood. Uh, quote, a single aircraft operating conditions favorable resistant contrail formation appears to exert a contrail induced radiative forcing some 5,000 times greater than the recent estimates of the average persistent contrail radiated forcing from the entire civil aviation fleet. Boom. So that's a bad thing. Um, and here we have that, you know, these climate models are pretty unpredictable. They said that every time you touch it, it goes bang and doesn't work. Um, they seem to have these models seem to have a life of their own and that's because they really don't account for aerosols or clouds at all in those um, reports in those models um, so that's a bad thing uh, what are they quote doing about chemtrails now there's two camps there's geoengineers talking uh, about using sulfur in planes to cool the planet from airplanes you know commercial aircraft and then the other camp is the oil industry that want to use biofuels to try to keep themselves from getting carbon taxed out of the sky. Um, so we have uh, Paul Crutzen's stratospheric sulfur injections. We have uh, right here, this is uh, the approach may, uh, that might be feasible is to perform wide area seeding with soot or carbonation, carbonaceous aerosols, carbon black dust, which would absorb solar um, radiation and warm cirrus layers enough to melt them away. Um, as noted by Crutzen in 2006, only 1.7% of the mass of sulfur is needed to produce similar magnitude of surface cooling. Um, then right here, right here we have used commercial commuter aircraft fuels doped with aerosol generators, dissolved or suspended in their jet fuel and later burned with the fuel, addition of sulfur to the fuel, release the aerosol through the exhaust system of the plane. Um, one exemplary technique may be via the jet fuel as suggested by prior work regarding me metal metallic particles. A potential delivery mechanism for seeding 
material is already in place. The airline industry, um, stratospheric injection of sulfur species, injected, injected sulfuric acid was injected. Let me read this whole one. Direct detection of total sulfuric acid has been achieved for the first time in a plume of jet aircraft in flight. The measurements show the same sulfuric acid signatures as for the case when sulfuric acid was injected directly into the exhaust of the jet, exhaust jet, and the case was sulfur was provided to the engine with the fuel. So either way, it does the same thing. Injection of um, sulfuric acid, a condensable vapor from an aircraft. Applying high fuel sulfur content at aviation cruise altitudes can cool the planet. Um, inject sulfate aerosols emitted uh, by aviation fuel. So, and then here's some more um, JP8 doped with sulfur is being tested at the access flights. We'll see that in just a second. Influences fuel sulfur on composition of aircraft exhaust plumes. The experiments sulfur one through seven. You can see those right here. Um, and then finally, stratospheric sulfate injections from commercial aircraft. Commercial aircraft could be used to deliver sulfate into the stratosphere, increasing uh, fuel sulfur content and the flight altitude of intercontinental flights. So they're talking about dumping a whole bunch of sulfur into the gas tank, and that would cool the planet off, which would turn these heating contrails into cooling ones, and turn that contrail frown upside down. Um, Biofuels and the order to save the aviation carbon taxes and greenwash dirty fossil fuels, climate friendly oil tycoons um, are switching jets to exotic blends of biofuels. George W. Bush signed into law the U.S. Energy Independence Act of 2007, making 21 billion gallons of biofuels mandatory by 2020. Coal biofuel, Camelina plant, municipal waste biofuel, that's your trash dump being turned into jet fuel, algae based biofuels, and even chicken fat biofuel. Um, you can't make this stuff up. And, of course, that's the NASA and the Aviation Climate Change Research Initiative testing this stuff. Chicken fat fuel looks cleaner, greener. <laughs> Gotta love that. So um, these access flights right now, they're actually flying up into the chemtrails and testing them out and seeing what these different fuels are doing to make clouds. And, you know, anyway, that's, that's their plan. So um, for those who doubt this biofuel stuff, that it has anything to do with contrails, boom your face, jet biofuel enlisted for contrail control. You can't get any more uh, blunt than that. So um, who's doing it? The U.S. Department of Agriculture Farm to Fly Program, um, alternative fuel effects on contrails and cruise emissions, that's the access flights. The Commercial Aviation Alternative Fuels Initiative, CAFE, Aviation Climate Change Research Initiative, ACRI, and that's at the FAA. I talked to the doctor who's running that. Project REACT 4C, reducing emissions from aviation by changing trajectories for the benefit of the climate. Center for Aviation Transport and the Environment, OMEGA, formation flying airliners, flying planes like birds to save on the gas bill. You ever seen a bunch of planes line up like birds? That's why. Climate compatible air transport system, CATS, and climate optimized routing of flights. You can see that right here. It's called the Contrail Cirrus Simulation Prediction Tool. It allows them to decide whether or not these, you know, it's going to make clouds. And if it's going to make clouds, it's going to heat the planet. We need to fly around those. Alternatively, if it's going to cool the planet, we can make some money on that. So um, the only other. Um, Solution they have for um, all these planes making clouds is called Cirrus Cloud Seeding. It's by Truth Story Elmo, another one of those geoengineers I mentioned earlier. And it's right here Cirrus Cloud Seeding, seeding via commercial airliners with bismuth triiodide to melt cirrus clouds. To sulfur or not to sulfur? That is the question. The European Union recently took bold steps to address flight pollution, but the Obama administration blocked that. And then under threats of lawsuits from environmental groups, the EPA is now deciding whether to regulate flight pollution for the first time ever. They said if the agency finds airline emissions to be a risk to public health or the environment, it will begin the process of crafting rules. So they asked for public input. People wrote in, and they said that if you want to have a hearing, let us know. I was the only person who called the EPA um, demanding a hearing, and uh, Lucy Audet from the EPA called me back and tried to talk me out of it. You can listen to that video right there. Finally, um, after I gave her a good tongue lashing, we had a hearing, and I was the, um, able to attend the world's first hearing on flight pollution ever. And you can see us, we were right there on, um, you know, right there on C SPAN, raising hell up in Washington, D.C., because something needs to be done about that. And you can see my transcript right there. 
So the battle is on. Um, the ICAO is supposed to regulate itself coming uh, this in the next month, February. Um, so they're going to write their own regulations. And basically, the EPA is holding off to decide whether or not to do something about it, um, you know, based on what laws they write on themselves. But what you'll see is the ICAO colloquium on aviation and climate change. This is Dr. Ulrich Schumann um, talking about, you know, what to do about the chemtrails. And he says this, the climate impact of aviation-induced contrail cirrus Aviation-induced contrail series, you got to love these terms, depends on aircraft properties, e.g. soot emissions, carbon black dust, and routing, avoid serious cloud-forming regions. And that was what I showed you up there with the uh, COSIP, the uh, you know contrail prediction tool. Both aspects offer a potential for aviation to reduce the climate impact of aviation, less soot emissions, less warming and more cooling contrails. So these heat trapping contrails, they want to turn them into cooling contrails. That is geoengineering. That is your red smoking gun everybody's looking for, but apparently people don't get it. I've posted this many times. Predictable for operational planning. So um, people ask me, what's the agenda? Why are, why are they doing this? What's the secret? I have to admit that I'm starting to lean towards melting the poles. So many vocal advocates have expressed their intent to melt polar ice to extract the vast oil and gas reserves for over 100 years, and it now seems their dreams are coming to fruition. The conundrum is that now it seems the climate scientists are opposing the interests of these oil tycoons in what has now been dubbed the New Cold War. The Obama administration and Vladimir Putin are in a silent battle over Arctic oil despite COP21's agreements and the scientific consensus that fossil fuel needs to end now. The war is simple. Fossil fuel billionaires are very close to monetizing Arctic oil now that the poles are melting and climate scientists are screaming bloody murder over the loss of Arctic ice. So that's why you see here, this guy's saying less soot, less soot, but the Air Force saying more soot, more soot. Let's, let's do some weather modification with that stuff. Um, so here's your references for that. 1877, Nathaniel Shaler said, and how did it change the North American climate? Uh, let's uh, send some unchilled uh, water up there. And uh, we could, uh, New England winters would become a quaint memory, and lawns and trees could commence their uh, march towards the poles. Yeah, we want to melt the poles there. 1889, Jules Verne's The Purchase of the North Pole. He talks about making a gun to fire it and uh, tilt the Earth's axis um, to melt the poles. Um, ironically, uh, I believe that did happen with the Fukushima 9.0 earthquake. The earth did tilt a little bit. Anyway, in 1921, Carol Livingston Riker in the New York, a New York engineer proposes a small book the, issued yesterday to change the climate of the whole Atlantic coast of North America and alter even the solar inclination of earth. So tilt the planet. His uh, plan was to send the great heat bearing Gulf Stream unchilled into the very heart of the Arctic to move earth and melt the pole. End of iceberg menace. Um, 1929, Herman Oberth uh, proposed building giant mirrors in, on space stations to focus the sun's radiative radiation on Earth's surface and uh, melt the poles. And here he goes, a picture of that. Got to be a bad idea. Um, then in 1945, Professor Julian Huxley, biologist for Secretary for General of UNESCO, proposed exploding atomic bombs uh, to, at an appropriate height above the polar regions to raise the temperature of the Arctic Ocean and warm the entire climate of the norm, northern temperate zones. By the way, these nuclear explosions happened in the 50s. So um, what you're going to see is this, this stuff, you know, they, they keep talking about it, but, you know, they're actually doing it. There's your nuclear explosions. Those are in the Arctic. Even over here, you see one up here in Alaska. But, yeah, that's their plan. They, they want to melt these the, the pole and get to all those vast oil reserves and gas reserves. Um, in 1958, M. Gorodsky and Va Valentin Cherenkov proposed placing a ring of metallic potassium particles in Earth's orbit, uh, you know, to melt the poles. And then in 1961, that happened too. Uh, the proposal became a reality with Project Westford when 480 million copper dipole antennas called the Westford Needles were launched into orbit. Bad, bad people. Bad people. So what does this have to do with chemtrails? In 1966, the Committee on Atmospheric Sciences from the National Research Council stated that in their report, Weather and Climate Modification Problems and Prospects, um, 
that jet aircraft are creating too much water vapor in the stratosphere and could raise Earth's surf tem surface temperature by 1.6 degrees Celsius. They say supersonic transports could double the concentration of water vapor naturally present and that a five-fold increase in stratospheric water vapor would raise the temperature of the Earth's surface by 1.6 degrees Celsius. That number is important because at COP21, they're all bitching about 1.5 degrees Celsius when they know that back in 1966, um, they were saying that water vapor from planes could heat the planet by 1.6 degrees, and nothing was done. In fact, at COP21, nothing's even being talked about uh, in regards to water vapor or clouds trapping heat. There, there's no mention, so there is your conspiracy. Why are all these climate scientists running their damn mouth about CO2, and never mentioning heat trapping uh, clouds or uh, water vapor from planes? And you can see that um, here's the links. The new Cold War drilling for oil and gas in the Arctic. The new Cold War. Russia sends troops and missiles to Arctic as Putin cl stakes claim on the region's oil and gas reserves. Counting the cost. The new Cold War. The race for Arctic oil and gas. Vanishing at 13% a decade. The melting ice is expected to make drilling, mining, and shipping easier. America falling behind the new Cold War over Arctic oil. The guys on um, AMEG, the Arctic Methane Emergency Group, they talk about methane from the Arctic blowing up the whole damn planet, but at the same time, they're talking about making money off of the fracking up there. It's called the Arctic Natural Gas Extraction, Liquefaction, and Sales Angels Proposal. Gotta love that. One side of their mouth, they're talking about the clathrate gun hypothesis and how um, dinosaur farts melted um frozen methane and that killed the dinosaurs and they're saying it's happening today so their solution let's go frack that uh, methane get it out of there before it reaches the atmosphere and save the planet oh and make a whole bunch of money in the process so you can also see right here um let's go to that it's water vapor not co2 the earth has certainly been warming since we've added so much co2 to the atmosphere from fossil fuel burning reply forget the co2 Water vapor is the most important greenhouse gas. It controls Earth's temperature. No mention of water vapor. In fact, all the debunkers say it's just water vapor. Well, guess what? That's a bad thing, too. And here you can see a map of uh, areas of high probability of oil and gas reserves all through the Arctic. And uh, they won't add it. And uh, they really don't care what you climate scientists have to say. So, um... Frequently asked questions. Isn't geoengineering illegal? Yes, almost. The Convention for Biological Diversity has banned geoengineering. They say that no climate-related geoengineering activities that may affect biodiversity take place until blah, blah, blah. But the U.S. did not sign that. Thank you to Olga Raffa for pointing this out from uh, Chemtrails Project UK. The U.S. is not a party to the 1992 Accord and thus was not officially involved in the geoengineering decision. So in uh, U.S. says, uh, F your uh, geoengineering ban. Chemtrails are full of barium and aluminum. True. IPCC reports on aviation and pollution confirmed that aluminum, titanium, chromium, iron, nickel, and barium are emitted from jet aircraft. And right here, A-L-T-I-C-R-F-E-N-I-B-A are estimated, meaning we guess, to be present in the parts per billion, and that's based on 1975, two, two reports from 1975. So, I mean, jets haven't changed that much since then, right? Jet fuel hasn't changed at all since then, right? I mean, these guys are jackasses for even putting a 1975 report in there and saying that it's a guess that that's in there. But we know it's in there. And you can see that's right over here. Um, metal, part metal particles in uh, aviation, aviation, global atmosphere, IPCC. So, um, yeah, they, they admit that it's coming out of there. They just don't say how much, and they really don't want to talk about it because they haven't looked since 1975. But if we uh, come over here to trace element polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon analysis of jet engine fuels, jet A, JP5, JP8, you can see that uh, JP8 is loaded with aluminum. And uh, they say not detected in jet A. I find that high, hard to believe since they're both based on kerosene diesel fuel and they both um, could randomly have any amount of JP8 or uh, aluminum in them. You also see there's strontium in there and titanium. Bam, bam, there you go. So, um, Status 450 was created in 1962 by DuPont. It's a barium salt fuel additive 
that's called an anti-static agent, and it's supposed to keep the planes from blowing up from the static discharge. Um, nonetheless, it's barium, it's a health concern, it's poisonous, and uh, they should not be putting that in there. The other metal found in cirrus cloud is lead. The big one we found is lead. It comes from things like tetraethyl lead and jet fuels. Uh, still used today in light aviation. Uh, it's probably the biggest metal we find and the most frequent metal we find, but as a but we find a whole host of different metals actually and this is a guy talking in the science podcast and he even says it would seem that you would have to change a lot, all of the aerosol in the atmosphere to get a radically uh, big effect on uh, clouds but mineral dust and metal particles are such a small amount of particulate matter just a percent or two it means that you only have to change about a percent or two of the particles to get a big effect on clouds and that's from clarifying the dominant sources and mechanisms of cirrus cloud formation so what you find out is um, these clouds are loaded with uh, lead, aluminum, and other metals. Um, the jet fuel is loaded with aluminum, and uh, barium comes from fuel additives. So there you go with that. Those are the facts. More details on that here. On off chemtrails, uh, most famous videos right here, and you can see that you know about halfway through, this guy's uh, damn the ads. Um, both of them are making clouds. Suddenly, the bottom plane's cloud stop. It's E3 AWACS, and it's reloading fuel from a KC-135, and then slowly it drops down, and you'll see that it drops down more, and then bam, they come back on. Well, the reason for that is because it's coming from the jet fuel, and when you put the engine to idle so you can fall out of formation, then you turn the engine back on to full blast. That's what it looks like. And it's just more confirmation of what we're talking about. Um, you can read more about that here. Mass distribution and concentrations of negative chemions, um, or chemions, however you say that, in the exhaust of a jet engine, sulfuric acid concentra concentrations, and observation of particle growth. And they say um, right here, the in-flight measurement found ions so massive that they um, should be thought of as charged particulates. The nucleation had already c occurred um, coming out of the engine. Chemions produced in the jet um, engine combustion are speculated to play a role in ion-induced nucleation of aerosols, possibly followed by condensation, which may result in the formation of contrails, cirrus clouds, and pollutants. So basically, you need, you need static, you need um, some charge to make the water and uh, negative, or all the, the particulates, the nanoparticles and everything in this fuel to stick to the, the soot. Um, and they believe this is part of the mechanism of that. So um, moving on, high bypass jet engines can't make contracts. Bullshit. Um, high, right here, you see in this uh, paper, it's on uh, sciencelarknasa.gov. Um, I've seen this several other places, but this is just the best example of it. More efficient aircraft create more contrails. So um, newer engines extract more heat to perform more work, have cooler exhaust and higher RH. Con um, contrail induced cloudiness may increase on par or more rapidly than CO2 emissions. So um, your high bypass engines actually make more um, contrails. Most people don't want to believe that, but hey man, you just got to look at cloud condensation nuclei, how this stuff works. There's your soot, and uh, there's, your, there's your reference right there. So we come back over here. Are chemtrails dangerous? True. Chemtrails are filled with metals and, most importantly, sulfuric acid. The health effects of breathing aluminum, barium are well documented, but the most overlooked concern from chemtrails is this. Acid rain. A high-flying theory on the acid rain problem. The jet's exhaust is already up there and it only, it only has to ch have a change in atmospheric conditions to precipitate out as acid rain. This is from 1982. But when I was in school 20 years ago, I heard about acid rain on a daily basis. Today, the term acid rain is rarely talked about. Geoengineers prefer to talk about ocean acidification and blame it on carbon dioxide. But they don't talk about acid rain from uh, these planes. So um, the other big concern is these trade secret ingredients. So everybody talks about the secrets behind chemtrails, but nobody really wants to look at the science behind it. But if you look... Um, a lot of these things don't even have material safety data sheets. And uh, a lot of them say proprietary, meaning secret, meaning trade secret. Proprietary secret, trade secret, registry number, blah, blah, blah. Meaning nobody even has a clue what's in that. Um, other than that, naphthalene, Sarah 313, Circla, xylenes, Sarah 3, um, these are cancer-causing chemicals. I mean, even if you look at what's in them, trimethylbenzene is a Sarah 313 chemical, 
um, and naphthalene. These, it's common in all these. There's more. Spec 8 AQ462, trimethyl benzene, naphthalene, circla. These are poisonous. These are cancer-causing carcinogenic chemicals. And even if you look at just what's in the fuel and these additives, you'll see it's poisonous. It causes cancer, and it's a bad thing. So conclusion, um, based on what we know, there should be no more no need for smoking guns or whistleblowers, jet aircraft, or geoengineering our skies. The military is more than likely involved. We are breathing metal particles, and the clouds are drenching us in acid rain. But nobody wants to talk about the acid rain. So... Um, we should be protesting at the FAA, EPA, Congress, and Parliament calling your representatives with the evidence in this article because there are plenty of scientific links here that you can prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is shady as all get out. And um, <laughs> unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing's going to get better. It's not. Um, for more info on that, I've got a timeline right here that you guys can check out and a whole bunch of articles that I've written, um, some details on the EPA hearing, how um, planes are just pissing all over your sky so i hope that you guys will check this material out um there's lots of references here sulfuric acid from aviation and ship tracks may be higher today than geoengineering srm would require in 2020 and uh that's a fact there's already enough sulfuric acid and acid rain up there um, more than what david keith ever asked for so um real quick over here in climate viewer 3d we come over here we're gonna look at the satellites i'm gonna click on this bad boy and you come over here to America right now, and you can see these tracks that we're all talking about. Oh, wait, they're not very visible there, are they? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on a special little NASA camera that makes it much more clear. Isn't that interesting? And there you go. These big cloud banks just coated with sulfur acid and soot and metal particles. You can see them daily on Climate Viewer 3D. Um, and I hope that you guys will care a little bit more about this beautiful Earth and that we can fix it. And with a little bit of science and education, we can go in and argue our point uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt and tell them, hey, man, we have had enough of this stuff. Um, military, you're not allowed to modify the weather with your uh, cloud-creating uh, contrail conundrum. And uh, these guys wanting to put some more sulfur in the jet fuel, shady it's just all shady so with that guys i really hope that you'll um research this if you really want to know what you're talking about if you really want to get down to the brass tacks it's about soot carbon black dust sulfuric acid and water vapor pollution which turns into acid rain so guys believe nothing that you hear and only half that you see and uh without a lot of education we're not going to be able to do something about this so i spent about five days putting all this together I hope you'll re um, review it, and if you have anything that I you think I got wrong or that I didn't put in there, please shoot it my way. I will revise this, but I've been doing this for three years, and I'm telling you guys, um, I studied the history. And if you look at the history, you'll see that those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it. And all of this has happened before. So, real quick before we go, 1958, new fuss raised over jet trails. So, be even back in 1958... They were blocking out the sky. Um, recently, our skies resemble a mob of exuberant sky riders performing an aerial circus. These contrails are breaking down into a haze and creating a cloud-like appearance in the sky. The Air Force so far is flabbergasted. However, in just a couple years, they got sued because all this has happened before, and what we need is we need a lawsuit today to fix this. Illinois and New Jersey officials will not settle pollution suits against the nation's major airlines out of court despite Tuesday's agreement between the airlines and the federal government to lean up jet aircraft exhaust. Representatives from 31 major domestic airlines agreed to install burner cans to eliminate uh, most of the smoke pollution from aircraft. And... Uh, Right here, U.S. to clamp down on jet pollution. The government will tell the nation's 43 commercial airlines Tuesday that they must end pollution of the skies with jet engine smoke. In 1970, chemtrails were called jet engine smoke, and they were polluting the skies. And they got sued, and they said... Um, 
that mainly at issue is the installation of the redesigned combustor or burner can on 3,000 existing, existing commercial jet engines of one maker that reportedly account for 70% of all smoke pollution from airliners. 43 commercial airliners must end pollution of the skies with jet engine smoke. 1970, guys. Those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it. And this has been going on since the dawn of aviation. And they've been sued before. And to fix it, they said they would install burner cans on uh, jet engines. So, um... That's our story, guys, and I'm sticking to it because all the evidence is there. And if you look at the history, I got more history here than you can shake a stick at. So um, please, you know, come review it, get to know it, so that we don't uh, have to deal with this problem much longer. So everybody, that's at chemtra uh, climateviewer.com/chemtrails. Again, I'm Jim Lee from Climate Viewer News, and uh, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing's going to get better. It's not. Thank you.